there's a new study that shows that or that suggests <coughs> that women who take the combined hormonal contraceptive pill they actually suffer shrinkage in particular regions of their brain yeah it, it's it's a quite a shocking study that's just come out so, yeah wow well, question uh, of those who had taken women who had taken hormonal contraceptives and then stopped did they show signs of recovery Yes, they did. So there was no difference in there. So so it looks like wow. it might, might be reversible. But then there are yeah. other studies. There are other studies. There was a study of hormonal contraceptive use and its relationship to depression recently. Yeah. And it showed that if you started taking hormonal contraceptive as a teenager, you would and then went to and then and then stopped taking it, you would always have a massively increased risk of depression as oh. a girl. Whereas if you if you're a, an adult woman and you go on it and then you come off, your rate of depression falls back to the norm. So that suggests oh, wow. That, so that suggests so that suggests that there is clearly some developmental function or developmental process that is affected in some way by taking uh, hormonal contraceptive as a teenager rather than as an adult. Would you like to know more? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Basecamp and a very special episode of it at that because we are joined by Raw Egg Nationalist, who I'm so excited to meet. We're meeting him because he's also speaking at the Natalism Conference that we're going to go to in Austin this December. But we've been very familiar with his work before. So yay, we have an excuse to talk with him. If you don't know Raw Egg Nationalist, he is an anonymous Twitter user with some really fun content. It's it's his Twitter username is actually Baby Gravy Nine, but he goes under Raw Egg Nationalist. You won't miss him. Plus, he's written four books, all part of the Raw Egg Nationalist present presents series on Amazon. But the most famous one is probably Raw Egg Nationalism in theory and practice. Don't you think but so? Like, is that his the biggest next one? book is going to be different, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, yes. tell us a little bit about this upcoming book and what it's on. Well, it's a ple it's a pleasure to be speaking with you both. This is uh, I've been really been looking forward to this. So, I wrote a book. My last book was called The Eggs Benedict Option, and that was my most detailed work to date about health and nutrition. I talked about basically about the global plan for a, or the plan for a global plant based diet and and the health and political ramifications of that. So. I'm kind of I'm following on from that, and I'm I'm writing in the same vein as 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 sort of all of the other books that I've written, the the main things that I focus on. But the the book is going to be called "The Last Men: Liberalism and the Decline of Mass," or actually, "Liberalism and the Death of Masculinity," rather. Mm. And it's about well, it's about it's about a lot of different topics that are that are very germane to our. <laughs> to our interests, our shared interests, yeah. to this natalism conference that we're going to, that we're both going to be, or that we're all rather going to be attending, it starts with a, it starts with a, a reinterpretation of Francis Fukuyama and his end of history thesis. And <sighs> there's, there's something very interesting. I mean, Fukuyama is a, is a thinker who is, he's, he's caricatured, he's straw man. You know, people see him as the epitome of liberal hubris and you know he's somebody who who supposedly believed that liberalism was the end stage of history in a very uncomplicated way and and you know an, an unnuanced way but actually when you read when you go back and read the end of history what you notice first or what i noticed what i i i came to my attention was the fact that actually the book is called the end of history and the last man oh. and the and the last man bit is very, very important. That's the final quarter of the book. And it's actually probably, it's, a de it's an absolutely devastating critique of liberal democracy, of the shallowness of liberal democracy and the fact that it will basically never be able to satisfy certain of man's very, very fundamental wants and needs including what the Greeks called megalothymia, which is the desire for distinction. So men desire distinction. Men desire to be better than one another. A man desires to be better than his peers, you know, to stand head and shoulders above, above the, the rest of the competition. And that's something Fukuyama says, look, liberalism is, is predicated on this thing called isothymia, which means that everybody is equal. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a desire to, it's a desire for equality. So 
liberalism can satisfy that aspect of our personality, this desire to, to be recognized at least as equals with our fellow men, but it can't do anything to provide us with a satisfying outlet for the desire actually to seek distinction. I, so I, this is the, ter the term here is megalothymia? Yeah, meg megalothymia is what liberalism can't satisfy. Yeah. Well, I also like this term in in relation to the manosphere because it sounds to me like a very good mirror for hypergamy in which we often talk about females having hypergamy. And I, I absolutely do believe that males have megalothymia. The males have this <laughs> innate desire to be better than other men. And you're right. It is not something that is provided for or or lauded within this system. Well, what's but what's I mean, what's interesting, of course, about this is that these are Greek terms, you know, <laughs> two, 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 two and a half thousand years ago, the Greeks recognized the Greeks had a better understanding of, I would say, individual psychology in many respects and the kind of motivating mm -hmm. factors that, that drive people to do particular things as human beings in a social setting. Well, Fukuyama says, look, liberalism is always going to have this massive, massive blind spot. It's not going to be able to satisfy people, ma ma man's, and he, I think he means particularly men's, mm -hmm. desire for distinction. Well, I think that I start from, I start and I say, look, this is actually really what Fukuyama is getting at. You know, he's not talking about the fact that liberalism is the best system in the world. And, you know, we've, we've reached the end point of history. He's actually saying we've reached this very difficult impasse where we've got a system that we probably kind of can't improve on really in certain respects. And we're probably not going to get away from, but it's also deeply unsatisfying. But there's a, there's a deeper aspect to it. There's, there's a, there's a sense in which what Fukuyama is actually saying isn't pessimistic enough hmm. because the, the, the megalothymia thing, the, the failure to satisfy man's um, man's desires for distinction and, and self and sort of projecting himself out into the world has a biological aspect to it too under liberalism. Mm -hmm. And this is where all of the stuff that I talk about, about endocrine disruptors, about unhealthy lifestyles comes in, testosterone decline in particular. Mm -hmm. And so I take, I I'm going to take megalothymia, the, dec the decline of megalothymia in liberal society as a proxy for, or, a, or a, as kind of code for testosterone decline and biological decline. And I'm going to look at how yeah. not only on an ideological level is liberalism totally unsatisfying for men but also on a biological level modern life is totally sapping man of his vitality and yep. uh, yeah so, so that's the basic yeah. premise of the book is that extending fukuyama to a biological level i want to i want to uh pull out an idea that you had here where and this is something that people may not know so something people will know likely either of our audience is going to know this is that endocrine disruptors appear to be changing the way gender is being expressed spe specifically feminizing both male bodies and behavior and we are dealing with a quick drop in testosterone what is it 30 percent over the past 20 years like insane yeah um, huge amount. yeah and What's interesting is that I think that we often, when we talk about this, when people like you or I talk about this, we often talk about it in terms of environmental like uh, pollutants that could be increasing this. But a really important thing about testosterone in men is that it will drop when a man feels disempowered. So when you are homeless or in other ways disempowered, your testosterone will drop pretty dramatically, which can have physiological and behavioral impacts. And it sounds almost like you're saying here is that you think that this empowerment may actually be a big reason of why male testosterone is dropping because they do not feel they can participate in these games they were built for. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's absolutely, that is absolutely a central a central part of my argument, I think, it's what we've done really is we've entered the perfect storm, really. So we've got all these social factors that are incredibly poisonous, really, for, for traditional expressions of masculinity. There are economic factors, physical factors, the fact that people are, you know, record obesity, people are less active than they were. And then you've also got this terrible, terrible environmental pollution crisis. And, and one of the things one of the things that I try to do is I I try to draw people's attention to the environmental 
pollution because it's not received a great deal of it's certainly not it's certainly not had as much of a spotlight as maybe these other factors in in testosterone decline and that was one of mm. the things i think that the tucker carson documentary the end of men did very well was it mm. it, it you know put this put the these these terrible terrible chemicals and their terrible effects on on male and female bodies right in the spotlight in a way that was that was actually unavoid you you couldn't not look at it and and that's and so that's yeah that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to I'm trying to give a as close to a complete picture, I suppose, of of all the reasons why masculinity is is really on the wane, and 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 it is, and it is, and I marshal all sorts of scientific studies because there, there there's a huge literature on testosterone decline and on the the various different factors that that, that that sort of weigh in on testosterone decline and it's what it but what it really needs i think is it needs it needs a compelling synthesis and that's what i'm trying to do one of the things that we were actually inspired to do after our first conversation with you and i want to let our fan in case any of them are interested in some way getting involved in this is is see what we can do to actually get some of these chemicals regulated in the uk um, because, uh, you know, we've been making a point of meeting more conservative UK politicians. And I think that this is actually a, a very doable thing. It's just not the thing that I think a lot of conservatives have in their evoked set, which is I should write an environmental policy bill. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. So when you put together a book like this and you are giving advice to the individual, what advice do you give the individual man today in today's society or woman today in who's either and then in women i guess it's in two stages either as a partner to somebody or somebody looking for a partner yeah there's there's a lot of although the problem is is dreadful and it and it, it really is i mean we're facing an unprecedented crisis i think uh there are there are simple meaningful things that you can do to improve your hormonal health and your and your health more generally and one of the one of the best things that you can do is to reduce your reliance on plastics so a, a, a huge number of these these endocrine disrupting chemicals bpa bisphenol a phthalates pfas per and polyfluoroalkyl substances they're all used in the manufacture of plastics and grease proof packaging and food packaging and and things like that. So if you can reduce your reliance on and in personal care products as well, this is a big thing for women, but also mm. for men to a lesser extent. If you can reduce your reliance on products that contain these chemicals, you can significantly reduce the levels of the chemicals in your body. So there was a I've talked I mean, I talk regularly on Twitter about particular studies and, you know, what they show about mm. exposure and, and mitigation of, of these chemicals. And there was a study that showed that the average sort of college age girl in the US will use at least eight personal care products a day that contain endocrine disrupt known endocrine disrupting chemicals. Some will use as many as 20 a day, every day. Wow. If so, you stop, well, I was just gonna say if you and then there's another study that shows that if you stop using these chem, if you stop using these products, if you just discontinue using personal care products, you can reduce levels of particular chemicals in your body by up to 50 percent within a matter of a few weeks. And that's a ma that's a massive decline. That's a massive, massive intervention, massively meaningful intervention. So there are very simple things you can do. So do you want to go over the fireman study here? Because I thought that was really powerful and endocrine disruptive. Yeah, I don't know if you've you've already seen this, but I know when, when a woman's about to be pregnant, like we're really concerned about basically everything the baby's absorbing because both male and female fetuses, babies mm -hmm. are exposed to, you know, all this while they're gestating. And it has a pretty significant impact on their development, as you know. So I keep thinking like, okay, well, how can parents, especially mothers who are about to be pregnant, avoid having really high concentrations of this sort of accumulated pollution in their body before they become pregnant? And the one thing that I found that was compelling was a study of firemen in Australia, where they measured the concentration of endocrine disrupting chemicals in their blood before and then after several sessions of donating plasma. And they found that it yes. did significantly reduce it. So it seems like one thing you can do is what you pointed out, which is just try to eliminate as much as you can. And you mm -hmm. actually, you know, because we're exposed to so much, like anything could be a big deal. But then another one is like eliminate it and to get out stuff that's been in accumulating, to donate plasma. <laughs> so it seemed like an interesting thing to do. I wish I knew that before I got pregnant for the first time. And, and yeah, I've, 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 I've seen that. I've seen that study. That's a very mm -hmm. interesting study. Then another thing that you can do, 
if you actually want to try and get rid of some of the stuff that's in your blood the, the, or, or in your body rather, because the, the problem is that these endocrine disruptors are largely, they're lipophilic molecules. So they, they go into, well, first of all, they can pass through fats, through, through the sort of fats in your tissue so they can get through your skin, but then they accumulate in your fat tissues. They make you produce more fat and then they accumulate in the fat tissues. So you have to find some way to get them out. Well, one way is to sauna as well. Saunas have been oh. have been shown, yeah, oh. to reduce. So sweating, sweating. And I think, in fact, they, there was a study where it showed that if you do a calorie-restricted diet and exercise that makes you sweat heavily, you can mm. shed quite significant quantities of these chemicals from the fat just tissue in your body but hold on I've, I've got a question here because i actually don't know this one but I, I i just realized this could cause a problem for a guy who's trying to get somebody pregnant i know that hot tubs absolutely destroy your sperm count for a really long periods of time like six months do saunas do the same thing i yeah i think i think it's i think it's yeah i mean it, it's hot yeah. i mean if your te if your testicles are getting very hot then what yes, andrew huberman I mean, does I, I think i heard him say this he, he goes in with an ice pack yeah, you can do that. Oh, he does. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Smart plan. Yeah. 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 You can have it all. <laughs> have it all. Actually, this this does bring me to something that I think is important, which is a lot of guys I know care about this stuff. Like when I when I talk to like right leaning young guys, I see this. But the problem is, is that this information is actually dramatically less relevant to adult males than it is to adult females this is information because if you're looking at who's going to be most impacted by endocrine disruptors it's men during their sexual development mm -hmm. and that means either in utero or you know really up to the age of let's say until they they find a long-term partner so let's say like 21 22 and so if you are a guy and, and and you're married and you're trying to have kids you could actually blunt a lot of the endocrine disruptors like with simone and i this morning when we were at some you know the clerk shoves a receipt in our face and i have to snatch it from with, with, without <laughs> her touching it because for me this is a fairly trivial effect compared to her who's a pregnant woman right now right and I just think that that's important to remember is it's a lot of guys tech their own and that's enough. And that's really, unfortunately, it would be easier if that were true. Mm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it's the thing about so many of these chemicals is that they are estrogenic in particular. Mm -hmm. So they mimic the effects of the, well, we call it the, the female hormone. <laughs> for convenience but estrogen is important in the male body as well and testosterone is important in the female body mm. as well and you need to remember this so a man who has a deficit of estrogen in his body will suffer all sorts of terrible problems including things like fertility problems and erectile dysfunction mm. uh, estrogen has an important role in in erectile function which mm. most men probably wouldn't realize so but the thing is that the vast majority of these chemicals as i say they they mimic the effects of estrogen now a woman having too much estrogen in her body that's bad too and it can promote cancers and and infertility and all sorts of other stuff but for men for develop it for the developing yeah. male body it is absolutely fatal it is absolutely fatal and the, yeah. the unfortunate thing is that now we are bathing in these estrogenic chemicals they are everywhere we've shown we've shown that they're in the placenta that they're in cord blood from the placenta that they cross the placental barrier they've been shown to be they've they've done studies of, of womb tissue that show you know the presence of of these endocrine disrupting chemicals within the actual womb itself in the amniotic fluid so i mean yeah any anything that you can do to re to mitigate your exposure to these chemicals is good is 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 fantastic and but but at the same time you have to remember that actually unfortunately you can't totally avoid exposure that's the that's the that's the that's the black pill as it were yeah. about these things is that they are everywhere well and this is something something i want to say i want to one touch on this really quickly this black pill which is something that we always tell people is 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 as things change because human biology is changing and human fertility is changing many technologies that religious groups historically could just say, well, we won't touch that and it won't have any effect on our group's vitality and ability to thrive. Now they're making much bigger sacrifices than they were historically. And of course, the technology I'm thinking most of is IVF. I think a lot of groups that are issuing IVF are really shooting themselves in the foot. And it, it, it actually kind of grosses me out when I see influencers, especially in the tradcast space that I know 
under the table are actually using IVF to get pregnant and they will like shame IVF because it gets them clout in their communities and their communities don't realize how hard it is for somebody to get pregnant without these technologies these days. Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely not a technophobe. I mean, I'd like to yeah. I'd like to think that there are natural ways that we can protect ourselves. There are simple ways that we can protect ourselves. You know, exercising will protect you to a degree against the effect of and uh, the effects of endocrine disruptors. So I'm going to do a a long post, I think, on Twitter tomorrow because I've dug up quite a few studies that show that actually the effects of exercise significantly mitigate some of the the nastier effects of endocrine disruptors. But it may very well be the case that actually this isn't a problem that we can solve on a societal level without the creation of new technology. I think it is it is it is a civilizational, it is a species level catastrophe that's taking place. Oh yeah. And and so yeah, I mean we I don't think that any option should be off the table. Another thing I want to touch on here from the last last bit of uh, conversation is when we talk about testosterone rates falling in things like women, I think a lot of guys are not aware of the psychological effects that's going to have in, in terms of a population. Because, you know, when you're talking about like changes this big, you're talking about an average difference in behavior patterns, which can be pretty big at the societal level. So I'll just go over the few that I remember off the top of my head and you can elaborate more if you can think of some. But I know specifically in women, if you have lower testosterone rates, that's going to lower aggression, particularly sexual aggression and sexual appetite is my memory. Like the biggest impact testosterone has in women is log like, like ordered logical thinking and sexual appetite. And I typically think if you're like, what does the mind of your average extremely high testosterone woman look like? I think Ayla is almost the perfect picture of what a woman <laughs> looks like when she's exposed to I, I, I want to say too much testosterone, but a very large amount of testosterone. And so I think if you're trying to contrast, like, what does a woman look like with extra testosterone versus what does one look like with un, a smaller amount of testosterone, uh, she, she's a good model of extra testosterone. Well, I I did a I did a tweet yesterday or the day before, I think it was about there's a new study that shows that or that suggests <coughs> that women who take the combined hormonal contraceptive pill they actually suffer shrinkage in particular regions of their brain. Yeah, it, it's it's a quite a shocking study that's just come out. So yeah, wow. Women women who take the combined hormonal pill suffer shrinkage of, I forget the, the name of the region, but it's a region that's associated with fear and emotional processing. And and what they did was they, they did these um, MRI scans of, of the brains of women who had never taken hormonal contraceptive, of women who were of women who had but weren't, of women who were who were taking it, and then of men. And they showed that this very particular region in the brains of women who, who were currently taking it was much thinner than than it should be and was in the in all of the other all of the other cases. And so that I mean that potentially, I mean all they're doing is they're showing look, this region of the brain is is thinner, but actually the potential implications i mean you, you can imagine and mm. look we all we all have we all have anecdotes we all have personal experience or a lot of us will have personal experience of mm -hmm. friends girlfriends who have taken the hormonal contraceptive pill and whose whose behavior has changed significantly either when they've gone on it or when they've come yeah. off it and that is that is an estrogenic that's an estrogenic chemical Question uh, of those who had taken women who had taken hormonal contraceptives and then stopped, did they show signs of recovery? Yes, they did. So there was no mm -hmm. difference in there. So so it looks like oh. it might might be reversible. But then there are yeah. other studies. There are other studies. There was a study of hormonal contraceptive use and its relationship to depression recently. Mm -hmm. And it showed that if you if you started taking hormonal contraceptive as a teenager you would and then went to and then and then stopped taking it you would always have a massively increased risk of depression as oh. a girl whereas oh. if you if you're a, an adult woman and you go on it and then you come off your rate of depression falls back to the norm so that suggests oh, wow that, so that suggests so that suggests that there is clearly some developmental function or developmental process that is affected in some way by taking uh, hormonal contraceptive as a teenager rather than as an adult. I really need to find that study. I think that's, that's going to be one of those studies I quote all the time now. 
Yeah, I, it's it's a, it's very interesting because, of course, as a default, it's just something you do. Like even as a teenager, even as someone who's not sexually active, you just do it. And it's that's really interesting. But <laughs> it's just... Huge it's just depression in our society today, but of course it can't be anything that psychologists are telling you to do because no. psychologists are the priest cast. <laughs> they, they do no wrong, right? Well, okay, so here's a question that I also wanted to ask. We were at a retreat this weekend and we were talking about endocrine disruptors with a lot of people. And this is something that actually comes up a lot when we talk about it. You know, we're talking about dropping testosterone, you know, that like, you know, from the tide studies, you know, men, young boys being born kind of a little bit less like boys, you know, they have smaller genital distance, they have less male dimorphic play when they're kids. Um, and, you know, we say this to people and, and, and a response that we get not uncommonly is, why is that a bad thing? And I'd love for you to comment on like, how do you answer people when they, when they say that, you know, where they're like, well, you know, who cares, you know, is it, is it so bad if there's less testosterone or less traditionally male behavior or if, or if men are less, less, less dimorphic? Well, well, I mean, I but there, there are a number of different ways to approach this. I mm -hmm. think the first, the first, <laughs> The first thing I, I would probably say is, look, this is a let's put the social stuff to one side. Let's let's put aside, you know, the way that men behave. This is a biological problem. Testosterone is an index of of, of male fertility, of male health, right? Reproductive health. If testosterone levels are declining, men are less fertile. It's going to be harder for people to have children. And it might even, as, as we're seeing now, it might even get so bad that actually within a couple of decades, men might not be able to to produce any sperm whatsoever the median man according to the predictions will produce zero sperm right i mean that's a that's a that's an extrapolation of of observed trends and that is you know if you are producing less testosterone your sperm quality yeah. and quantity will decline so there's that you you know there's no getting away from that the the social thing of course is well it depends on the kind of society that you want to create, right? Mm. And and if you are the kind of person who who in a, a kind of misguided but well-meaning way wants, you know, for there to be no conflict within within civilization, no conflict among people, no, you know, you want everyone to be friends, then you might think, oh yeah, no tes testosterone decline. That's great because testosterone is the aggressive hormone, isn't it? Testosterone is testosterone that makes men nasty it's testosterone that makes men fight and murder and rape and, and and do all the things that are regressive and that we don't want in a modern liberal society but that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what testosterone is mm -hmm. and what it does mm -hmm. and testosterone doesn't uh, estrogen makes men aggressive and there are plenty there are plenty of studies that show that actually it's an it's a deficit of testosterone and an imbalance of estrogen that makes men aggressive so that's so interesting well there's a wonderful there's a wonderful study that i that i absolutely love to quote and I, I quote it as much as i can they did a they did a study on male macaques where they fed them soy isoflavones oh, wow. um, and soy isoflavones are estrogenic so they're phytoestrogens so they're naturally occurring plant estrogens mm -hmm. and what they discovered was that if you feed male macaques soy isoflavones they basically become incels they become passive aggressive incels so they they observed that male macaques this was a study i think from 2004 male macaques who consume or were fed significant quantities of soy isoflavones became more aggressive and simultaneously more submissive so they isolated themselves from the fellow members of their troop they they behaved in a submissive way but were also more aggressive so it's yeah. like i mean i i mean i it actually got that study actually got picked up by joe rogan as well and he said i think this explains a lot about you know like modern modern sort of soy boy men well, the it's, it's the it's the personality type that i always imagine when i think of the stereotypical like vegan yeah yes <laughs> yeah exactly it's it's avoids avoids direct head-on confrontation with other men or with other people but does sneaky nasty things when they can get away with it it's yeah. so i mean it's it's the i think that one thing that actually really needs to change and this is something that i'm trying to do in my own small way is to educate people about the the nature of testosterone that it isn't just the it's not the aggressive hormone testosterone is involved yeah. in 
I mean, there are all sorts of studies that show that that men with more testosterone are more generous, that men with more testosterone are more faithful to their partners. Oh, this is so crazy because I've not heard this and I've not seen Mm. this and I didn't even know about the estrogen thing. And that's that's pretty so, Simone, huge. You, you, you better dig in on this. And I all need to I'm clearly trying to dig do in on this. Yeah. Educate men on the dangers of interacting with vegetarians. <laughs> so, I'm joking. <laughs> this has been fantastic. And we would love to have you back on. So thank you so much. And and I actually learned a lot from this. Like yes, I me. I knew it, I know enough about this subject to know that you really know your stuff on this, mm-hmm. but not enough to know all of the studies that you're mentioning here. So I am really excited to dig further. And uh, yeah, we'd love to have you back. And where should we point people who enjoyed this conversation? So follow me on Twitter. I'm babygravy9. And you can, I have roignationalist.com, which also will point you in the direction of all of my writing and mansworldmag.online. So I have an online magazine, men's magazine, a bit like a sort of revived Playboy. So go there too. But but Twitter is Twitter is the main place. I also have a Substack now as well, roignationalist.substack.com. I'm regularly putting out all sorts of content, essays, analysis of new scientific studies, that sort of stuff. And I'm talking about testosterone and estrogen, also posting excerpts from my new book as well. So spectacular. Rag Nationalist, you rock. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.